So the entropy of a sample of matter will increase as it changes from a solid into a liquid or from a liquid into a gas. Um, so we can think of this in a more casual or informal way by saying, well, when we go from a solid to a liquid, now this is more disordered, right? Here in the solid, the particles, um, whether it's a crystalline solid or an amorphous solid, the particles are fixed relative to each other. When you melt it, now they can move around, slide around next to each other. And so that's more disordered. And going from a liquid to a gas, well, particle movement is present in both of these. But here, the volume is smaller than in the gas. In the gas state, the particles are moving. And they're also just like spread out over a huge volume. right? So that's more disordered. Formally, though, thinking about microstates, when, when you go from a solid to a liquid, now you have more microstates that are possible, more energetically equivalent ways of arranging the particles. And then going from a liquid to a gas, again, there are more energetically equivalent ways, more microstates. Does that make sense? So let's compare a gas and a solid. Um, a gas has more ways to distribute its energy than a solid does. So we're looking at water here. Water in the gas state, we can have rotation. Those molecules can just kind of spin. Um, we also have translation, kinetic energy. So moving from one place to another. So there's two different kinds. Um, in water solid, we only have vibration. These guys can't spin in place, they can't rotate, and they have no translational movement. All they can do is wiggle around in place. So we have more ways to distribute the energy as a gas. It has more places to put the energy, so it has more microstates. Any questions? Gas molecules can also vibrate. So we have a positive entropy change for phase transition from solid to liquid, from solid to gas, from liquid to gas. We also have an entropy change if during a chemical reaction, the number of moles of gas increases. Because if we have more gas particles, we have more possible places to put the energy. That make sense? So predict the sign of delta S for each of these processes. So water in the gas state going to water in the liquid state. Negative. Negative. Because it's becoming more ordered. There are fewer microstates. How about solid carbon dioxide sublimes? That's going to be positive. Because that is a state transition from solid to gas. And how about this chemical reaction here? These are all gases. 2N2O is going to 2N2 plus O2. It's going to be positive. Because we're starting with two gas molecules and we're ending up with three gas molecules. So then we have the possibility of two of them having most of the energy and one of them having less, or we have all these different combinations of where that, that overall energy could be distributed. So this is a positive change in entropy. Any questions? When we have a change in state, that's accompanied by an exchange of heat between the system and the surroundings. Right? So when an ice cube melts, energy, heat comes from the surroundings into the ice to melt it. Entropy is related to the distribution of energy among the particles that compose matter. So the change in entropy occurs when a system exchange, exchanges heat 
with its surroundings at a constant temperature. So we can write an equation for the change in entropy as being um, heat divided by temperature. And here, the temperature is not changing, it's staying the same. We put the REV subscript on this Q because we're talking about heat being exchanged in a reversible process, one that could go the other way. Temperature, as always, is in kelvins. And if you have a hard time remembering when do we need to use kelvins, um, just use kelvins. Because um, here, if we use Celsius, the temperature of ice water in degrees Celsius is zero. And dividing by zero is, it just never works out very well, right? Kelvin avoids all of that div dividing by zero. So entropy then is a me measure of energy dispersal per unit temperature. And earlier we talked about the units of entropy being joules per Kelvin. Hopefully that makes a little more sense now. Energy dispersal, energy measured in joules, per unit temperature. So when something melts, it absorbs energy from the surroundings. That energy then becomes dispersed into the system, and the entropy of the system increases. Does that make sense? What's a reversible process? Uh, we define a reversible process as one that reverses direction upon an infinitesimally cha small change in some property. So make a tiny, tiny change in, in some property and you can make the reaction go in the other direction. So ice melting at zero degrees Celsius is reversible because a very small removal of heat will cause the melting I mean, we'll reverse the melting and cause it to freeze again. It's, it's like it's teetering, right? If you're melting ice at a higher temperature, it's not reversible. So an ice cube sitting on the bench top, it's roughly, you know, 21, 22 degrees in here, that's above the freezing melting point of ice. And so it's exchanging heat with warmer surroundings and so a very small change in, in the heat, taking a little bit of heat out of it, is not going to cause the process to reverse. Does that make sense? So when we're talking about a reversible process, it's a process that's in a, a state of equilibrium. And these, these things are highly idealized. Okay, so if they don't really exist, perhaps, but we can think of them that way. So let's calculate delta S. Uh, calculate the change in entropy that occurs in the system when 10 grams of acetone vaporizes from a liquid to a gas at its normal boiling point. And we're given um, that boiling point and the heat of vaporization. Well, let's use that equation we just learned, that um, delta S is Q reversible divided by temperature. So is this evaporation reversible? It says it's at its normal boiling point. So that, the boiling point is the equilibrium temperature between gas and liquid. They, they're both going to exist there. This is a reversible process. It's like the melting at the melting point. So what we need is the amount of energy that's being transferred and the temperature. Well, we've got the temperature in Celsius. So we can convert that to Kelvin. 56.1 plus 273.15. Yep, 329.25 Kelvin. 
and then we need Q. Well, we're given heat of vaporization. This tells us that if one mole of acetone evaporates, uh, Q is going to be 29.1 kilojoules. How many moles of acetone do we have? We can figure that out. Right? We can take the 10 grams of acetone and we can convert that to moles of acetone. And then we can use delta H kilojoules per mole. So delta H said 29.1 kilojoules per mole. And we need the molar mass of acetone. So we were given the formula there because we don't expect you to know that one. So we've got 3 times the mass of carbon plus 6 times the mass of hydrogen plus the mass of oxygen. I'm getting 58.078 as the mass of one mole of acetone. What are the common units of entropy? Joules per Kelvin. This is going to give us kilojoules per Kelvin. So as long as we're doing this, let's convert this to joules. Kilo means times 10 to the 3. One kilojoule is 1 times 10 to the 3 joules. So I've got 10 divided by the molar mass times 29.1 times 10 to the 3. I uh, should probably have three significant figures on that, so we'll call that 5010 joules per Kelvin. If we had left it in kilojoules, it would be 5.01 kilojoules per Kelvin. The question doesn't specify the units. Any questions? Okay, so it was pointed out to me that everything's really screwed up here. I guess I saw the K down here and just jumped ahead. Um, we are not done here. We're just calculating Q. So, yeah, that many joules. It'd be great if you guys could point out my screw-ups <laughs> a little sooner, okay? You're not gonna hurt my feelings. I've just completely resigned myself that I am absolutely very, very human. Okay. Here's Q. <coughs> I'd love to say I was trying to see if you were paying attention, but ah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's not true. Okay, we need Q divided by the temperature. I was kind of wondering why it came out to be such a big number. Okay, let's try that. <laughs> divided by 329.25. Um, 15.2, well, I should have three sig figs, so I'm going to round it there, 15.2 joules per Kelvin. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out, Chris. <laughs>